Well, good morning, Airborne Church. I'm going to try that again. Good morning, Airborne Church. One thing that's going to help me... Thank you, Lenny. Good morning to you, too. One thing that's going to help me a lot is if we're, if we're active this morning. It lets me know you're paying attention. It lets me know what I'm saying is actually landing. And I believe the Holy Spirit has something for us this morning in this message. And uh, let's give it up for my dad one more time, father-son duo. If you can't tell, I look a lot like my dad, a little less gray hair, a little bigger biceps, a little smaller waist, you know, but he'll get there, don't worry. You know, this theme that we have, a vision that we've been speaking on the beginning of this year, it's been amazing. It's something that I love, and it's something that I want to thank pastors Kevin and Beth, Pastor Kevin is actually in Maine right now, Pastor Beth down here on the front row with us. Just thank you guys so much for not only the opportunity to speak on this subject, but for demonstrating this subject for 20 years, for continuing to push forward. Because as a young man, as someone even in high school, I admired the vision of the church. And I've admired the persistence to keep going. And for those of you guys who don't know, Pastor Kevin will work 24 out of 24 hours in a day if he has to, to get it done. And Pastor Beth will smile as he comes home from a 24-hour work day and say, hey, I'll, what do you need? <laughs> she's there to support, and she's the mother of the house. So thank you, guys. You know, Pastor Kevin started off this series the beginning of the year as he talked about the importance of a personal vision. And I hope you guys have been thinking about your personal vision. And as we talk today, I'm actually going to encourage you to go one step further. I'm going to challenge you guys to go another step and actually write down your vision. And we're going to talk about that today. But there's two different types of vision. Oh, and let's not forget Pastor Beth speaking on purpose and finding your purpose. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that today, too. But there's two different types of vision. There's a community vision that we support. And then there's a personal vision that we each have. And sometimes people's per personal vision will create a community vision and will require support of others. And a lot of times our personal visions will require support of others as well as we build together and are ultimately after the same mission of building the kingdom. But today I want to talk about that personal vision. So if you guys have something to take notes on today, I highly recommend you take some notes. Because if you're going to take this challenge, if you're going to write your personal vision, there's some things, some good guidelines, some good outlines for you to follow in here. The title of this message is, message is called Personal Vision, Calling, Desires, and Restraints. Calling, Desires, and Restraints. Now, I've had the opportunity to work with an executive coach for the past six or seven years, and every year we've wrote a vision. Every year we adjust our vision. Every year we present our vision. We put it to paper and we present it to other people. And it's an important time because it gives me focus. It gives me something to work towards. It gives me you know, something to have a focus on and actually keep going after. And through hard times, it gives me something to refer back to. So that's why it's so important to write it down. In Habakkuk 2.2, it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it plainly on clay tablets so that the one who reads it will run. Habakkuk is a, is a book that's written as a poem, and it's a conversation between Habakkuk and God, and God gives some revelation, gives some vision to Habakkuk of what's going to happen for the people. And he said, write it down on clay tablets, so whoever can read it will run. It's important that we write it down, because if we don't write it down, when the future comes and when the hard times come, we forget the small de details. We might remember the big concept, but we're going to forget all the details that mattered so much to us in the moment, that mattered so much to us that we wrote it down. We also write it down so we can share with others. Like I said, every year that I've written a vision, I've had the opportunity to present it to other people because when you start to speak it, it also takes more power as there's power in the tongue. Now, before we get into desires, restraints, and calling, I'm going to give you a couple, a couple tips when writing your vision. I like a three-year time period. That's what my coach uses, and it's a perfect time period. So write what you want your life to look like in three years. The reason I choose three years is because three years, it's, a lot, it's a hard to have a lot of big changes, a lot of giant shifts in one year. Although God can show up suddenly. And you might have some big things you want to happen this year, but write what you want three years from now. 
I don't like going five or 10 years because it's so far off that sometimes five or 10 years we procrastinate too much on. And we don't actually start working towards it because it seems so far away. So I like three years. If you've never wrote a vision before, it can be really hard to get started. So I recommend starting with the five Fs. I put them up here on the screen. We got faith, family and friends, finances, fitness, and fun. And for family and friends, it's really any relationship. What do you want your faith to look like in three years? What do you want your, your relationships to look like in three years? What do you want your finances to look like in three years? What do you want your fitness to look like in three years? Remember, our body's a temple. And what do you want your fun to look like in three years? Because we're meant to also have fun. And be specific with these things. Don't put in your vision, I want to read my Bible more. That's not a vision. How many times a week do you want to read your Bible? How many minutes a day do you want to read your Bible? Don't put in there, I want to be in shape. How, what weight do you want to be at? What size clothes do you want to fit in? Don't put in there, I want to love my wife or my kids more. How are you demonstrating the love week in and week out three years from now? We need to be specific in our vision. Another thing to remember as you're writing your vision, again, before we get into the other three big points, it's about you. It is your personal vision. And when I say that, it's how you show up in situations. It's the choices that you make. It's, it's specifically about your life three years from now. And it will impact other people's lives, but try to refrain from writing expectations for other people. I have a son, he's three years old. He'll be six years in three years. In my vision, I'm not gonna write, Kaiser's playing basketball and loves it. I don't know if he's gonna love basketball. I can't put that expectation on him. Lord, we pray he loves basketball because some other sports, not fun to watch. <laughs> but I can't say he's gonna love basketball. But what I can say is I'm gonna be a father that encourages competition, that encourages hard work, that encourages putting his skill set into something and pushing himself to expand his capacity. I can put that in there because that's something I can take responsibility of. We got to make sure in our vision, it's, we're not putting responsibility on other people. And if we write expectations for other people, it pushes the responsibility off yourself and there's no way to hold yourself accountable to that vision. There's no way to hold the line for that vision. So you got to make sure it's responsibility for yourself. And couples, just as you are two people who come together to form one when you get married, you should each have a personal vision that comes together to form one. Something my wife and I started doing last year and we did it this year. Like I said, I've been preparing visions for the past six, but we've been taking a small trip away where we just get away from all the noise. We take a one or two nights away. We, it's just us two. We reflect on the year prior. We look at the next year and we talk about vision. So we can make sure our vision is in alignment. If you want a, a tip on conflict revolution, resolution, not revolution, it's not a fight. <laughs> Conflict resolution is have a vision for your marriage that you are both in alignment of. Have a vision for your guy's life that you are both in alignment of because, hey, when conflict arises, it's not about who's right or wrong. It's who's more in alignment with vision. And then there's no, there's no fight. It's this is in alignment with vision, this isn't. And it will help, like I said, that conflict resolution, not revolution. And my last point before, my last tip before we get into the actual message here is make sure it's big enough that only God can make it happen. Leave room for God to show up. If you write a vision in your own strength, you're undercutting your vision. You're chopping it out at the legs. You're not making it big enough. God's called you to so much more, but he's called you to rely on him as well. So make sure it's only big enough with God. Now, I've compiled all my notes over the years with my coaching and... Um, put together a definition for personal vision. Um, and when you hear it, you're gonna be like, man, that's straight out of Webster. But no, I wrote it. So personal vision, a trajectory for your life full of desires and restraints that will execute the calling God has for your life. A trajectory for your life full of desires and restraints that will execute the calling God has for your life. Now, I highlighted three words in there, desires, restraints, and calling. And we're going to start with calling because it's the most important out of the three. 
Desires and restraints are important, but your calling is the most important. So point number one, your trajectory of calling. Before we get into the word calling, I want to put emphasis on the word trajectory. Remember, I said I encourage you to write a three-year vision. Well, your three years is not your end. It's your trajectory for a new beginning. It's a, it's a plot in your path. And we want to focus on going in the right direction, but don't be surprised if your end destination changes multiple times. That's okay. The trajectory is so we're headed in the right direction. My vision has changed each and every year by little increments, but the total outcome is always the same. I'm in the same direction of building God's kingdom. So, trajectory of calling. There's two types of calling as well. I'm going to go over a blanket calling and a specific calling. What I consider a blanket calling is something that covers all people. No matter who you are in the world, if you're a human being, you were created by God, and you have a calling on your life. So I'm going to go over those things, because if your calling at least includes the blanket calling, you know you're in the right trajectory. You know you're headed in the right direction as you figure out the specific calling, because the specific calling will take longer to figure out. In Proverbs 3, 6, it says, in all your ways, submit to him. He will make your path straight. If you start writing this and you're not really sure which direction to go, start submitting more things to him. He'll start to give you more clarity. Proverbs 3 continues to talk about other things, about keeping God first and tithing with your first 10%, seeking wisdom first, don't be afraid because God's always with you. And Proverbs is full of things like this. But that one scripture sums it all up. If you submit everything to him, you are in alignment with your calling. But you have to be willing to put God above everything. And in the New Testament, the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. This is right when Jesus came back. He died. He conquered the grave. He conquered hell. He came back to the disciples and he said, look, I'm going to give you one thing to do. Go make disciples of the world. If your calling includes going to make disciples of the world and it includes keeping God first, those are in its simplest forms. Now, those are really complex ideas, but in its simplest form, if it includes keeping God first and leading more people to Christ, you're on the right trajectory. And that doesn't mean you have to be a pastor. It doesn't mean you have to speak. You can do it wherever you're at and wherever you work at, wherever you walk at, wherever you're at, God is with you and you can be an extension of him. Now let's dive into a specific calling because this is where it gets a little bit more detailed. This is where it gets a little bit different for all of us. The first thing with specific calling is you need to know that you have value. If you want to lead more people to Jesus, you must first acknowledge and honor the power that Jesus has in your own life. If you're constantly complaining about how bad your life is, it's going to be hard to lead people to Jesus. You need to honor what God is doing great in your life. You need to honor the blessings God is doing in your life if you want to lead more people to Jesus. As a human being, we have innate value. And a while back, I talked about self-identity and how we're a royal priesthood. We're a child of God. And God sees us higher than any other creation that he made. He holds us in the highest standard. So you need to understand that you have that same value, that that value is in you if you want to lead more people to Jesus. Now your value comes in three things. It comes in gifts, skills, and communication with God. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. Now remember, I said there's gifts, there's spiritual gifts, there's natural skills, and there's communication with God. Your spiritual gifts, you're born with them. You're born with a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit gives each and every one of us specific gifts. And as you use them more, they'll continue to grow stronger. It's like a muscle that you exercise. And just to give you guys a couple ideas of some and Pastor Beth mentioned in her message, there's a test online you can go take. Um, you can read about them online. I think it's giftstest.com. I went and took mine. My top five, you guys want to hear them? My top five are leadership, word of wisdom, faith, giving, and teaching. That's what my top five came back at. 
Now, these are gifts that doesn't mean they're always in use. Not every word I say is wise. Only 96% of them. <laughs> My wife shakes her head, yes, amen. <laughs> but not every single word I say is wise. But the more that I, I speak with the Holy Spirit about words of wisdom, the more he'll use me to speak words of wisdom in other people's lives. These gifts are meant to be tapped into and meant to be utilized, but it takes the Holy Spirit to also utilize them. It's important to realize, too, that no gift is greater than others. So as you read the gifts and you read that somebody else may have one that you want, it's not our job to envy. It's our job to use the gifts that God gave us. And each of them hold innate and powerful value. If you guys want more research on spiritual gifts, we don't have enough time to go into it today because we could spend six hours talking about spiritual gifts, but I'm going to put three scripture up on the screen here for you so you can write these down if you want to go back this week and read about spiritual gifts 1 Corinthians 12 8 through 11 and 28 that's where a lot of the spiritual gifts are found Ephesians 4 11 through 13 also shows a lot of the spiritual gifts and Romans 12 6 through 8 those scripture verses will show you the spiritual gifts that God has placed in the Bible it summarizes them in lists for you Obviously, you'll find some more throughout the Bible, but these are the three scripture passages that will give you lists of spiritual gifts and read about them, study them, find what resonates in your life and continue to ask the Holy Spirit to utilize you and utilize that muscle. Now, natural skills is the second part of this. Your natural skills are what you've done over and over again to where you've almost perfected it. Natural skills are things we use in a worldly standard, but things we can use to also support the kingdom. Something I learned in a natural skill is in business is I've learned the sales and marketing side of the business. I don't know the admin, the accounting, the taxes side, but what I understand is sales and marketing very well. I understand how to generate more revenue for companies. And that's what I focus my attention on. How do I build the kingdom with that? Well, when I'm in these other for companies, I'm an open Christian, I'm an open book, and I'll speak on my relationship with God to anybody. How else can I do it? In business, if I can become a really successful business, I can give more to the church and help with things like the building foundation. Speaking of building a natural skill, the building you're sitting in was a lot of donated or discounted time, labor, and material to build this building so we could stay under budget for building our church. That was way people, ways that people could give their natural skill to God's house, whether it was woodworking or concrete or drywall or electric electricians or plumbers, whatever it may be, they use their natural skill that they use on a world, worldly standard to build a kingdom. It's important we use our strengths to support the kingdom. Don't ignore your weaknesses, but double down on your strengths. Know what you're good at. Stay in your lane and keep going after it. Keep growing at what you're great at. And the third thing is communication with God. As we look in the Bible, we see different people with different visions but God never gives them all the answers. The only way that they can keep going is that they stay in communication with God. Right, let's look at Noah. God comes to Noah and says, build the ark. Gives him all the specifications on how to build the ark. He didn't tell Noah how to find the wood. He didn't tell Noah exactly what to do when the the water settled. There are parts of it Noah had to just continue to believe and continue to step forward even though he didn't have all the answers. Mary was told she was going to give birth to a savior and to name him Jesus. That was all the parenting advice she got. Name him Jesus. (laughs) After the shock wore off, she had the baby. She goes back home and then she's like, the the savior of the world, I'm supposed to be his mom. Imagine the the pressure to feel to be a mother on top of, of already just being a mother, also being the mother to the savior. Moses in the burning bush God told him that he was going to lead him to the land of milk and honey. And he told him some specific things to go tell the Pharaoh. But God didn't tell him he was going to have to part a Red Sea. God didn't tell him that there was going to be giants in the land when he got there. God didn't tell him all these obstacles he was going to have to face along the way. God didn't tell him the Israelites was going to be the biggest complaining party as they walked. And that he was going to have to deal with that attitude as well after he just saved them. God didn't tell him all those things. There's going to, don't wait for you to have all of the specific answers to get started on your vision. It's what I like to call faith blanks. We fill them in as best as we can. We write the the specifics the best we can. And don't be 
ashamed if you have to change them as God reveals more and more clarity. But we can't just sit around and wait for all the answers because in all of these stories, in every story in the Bible, God didn't give anybody all of the answers except for Jesus. So we have to go ahead and get started. As we wrap up calling, your specific calling should support the blanket calling. Whatever it is God has called you to do as an individual, to use your gifts, to use your skills, to use the communication with him, it should support building the kingdom. Because God still comes first. Before we build our own kingdom on earth, we have to build his kingdom. Your personal vision will also support the community vision and will support other personal visions. It's a chance for us to build interdependence where we're both strong on our own, but we can go even further and stronger together. We can come together as a community and make a bigger impact when we each have strong personal visions. Number two, we're going to talk about desires, the things that you want. And I want to let you know right now, it's okay to want things. It's okay to want big things. It's okay to want the house. It's okay to want the car. It's okay to want the vacation with your family. It's okay to want these things. There's some old school thinking that Christians aren't supposed to be wealthy. That's wrong. We're just not supposed to put items and money above God. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy the things while we're here on this earth. In Psalms 37, 4, it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, I looked into this word delight in Hebrew. I thought this was really unique. Because the word delight in Hebrew also shares, is also the word anag which means to bring great pleasure. And it was also used in, it was mainly used when talking about garments. If somebody wore a really nice silk garment, they would speak about how nice the silk is. They weren't talking about how nice the shirt was or how nice the garment was or the robe. They were talking about how nice the silk itself was when they used the word nag. And they use this word specifically in the scripture because when they're talking about God and it says delight in the, in the Lord, it's not talking about delighting in what God does in your life. It's not talking about delighting in the favor that he pours, the blessing he gives. It's talking about delighting in who he is as your father. It's talking about delighting in him as a person, a person of substance, not all of the things that he just does for you. God does also want to bless us in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. For everyone who seeks finds and whoever knocks, the doors will be opened. Make your desires big. God wants to bless you. He's just waiting for you to ask. He's just waiting for you to knock. He's just waiting for you to call out to him. And serve. we serve a God of double portion. We see that with Job. We serve a God of exceedingly abundantly more. It says that in Ephesians. We serve a God that wants to do even more than what your vision currently states. And that's why I encourage you to level it up and make it only possible with God. And number three, the restraints. As an American society, we've become, we've fallen in love with the idea of freedom. And freedom is good. It's why we can all sit here today because we have freedom of religion. But your vision can't just be a vision of freedom. There's restraints. You know, Pastor Kevin spoke on the, the scripture, Proverbs 29. It said, without a vision, people will perish. In another translation, it says, without a vision, people will cast off restraints. When we live without restraints, we live in chaos. I mean, we have the Ten Commandments, right? No other gods, no other idols. Don't use the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath holy. Honor your mother and father. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. And don't envy your neighbor. We have those as restraints already. And I don't know about you, but I don't want freedom in my relationship with my wife. In my vision, I want a strong covenant with my wife and God. I don't want freedom in our relationship. Heck, I don't even want freedom in my diet. I want to feel good. I want to look good. I want to take care of my body. I want restraints in my diet and my vision. There's discipline in the restraints. And it means you're going to have to say goodbye to some things. And if the worship team wants to go in and come up, you're going to have to say some goodbye to some bad habits. But I'm going to encourage you to look a layer deeper. Say bye to whatever caused the bad habits in your vision. 
Dig a little bit deeper in your vision and your pain. It's not about just saying bye to the drugs or alcohol. It's about saying bye to the pain that you're trying to numb in the first place. It's not trying to say bye of speaking negatively or or being rude to somebody. It's about saying bye to the resentment that you hold for them in the first place. We need to go a layer deeper in our vision. We need to dig a little bit deeper on what's causing us to do the bad actions that we know are not in alignment with the best version of ourselves. Remember, a vision is supposed to be the best version of yourself. And really quick, because we're short on time, I'm going to summarize these next two. There's two things you got to remember to stay in alignment with your vision. One is commitment. Look, commitment's not good or bad. We always look at commitment as a good thing, but commitment can all, commitment itself is a neutral word. And the truth is, is we're all committed to something. You're committed to something good or bad, but the commitment itself is neutral. Meaning it's not that you're not committed to being sober. It means you're more committed to being addicted and numbing the pain. It's not that you're, you have commitment issues and that's why you can't have a stable relationship. It's that you're committed to the single lifestyle as opposed to committed to a covenant with God and somebody. Commitment is not good or bad, but it's required. You need to be committed to your vision. You have to be committed to the better version of yourself and let go of the commitment to the old version of yourself. And it takes excellence. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not an act, but a habit. It needs to be a habit. It's not something we do every now and then. Excellence needs to show up in every area of our life because that's what we've been called to do. That's excellent in your action, in your work. And yeah, we need to work hard. If you have a big vision, do not expect it to come easy. It's gonna take a lot of hard work. If you look at any vision in the Bible, it took a lot of hard work and a lot of trials and tribulations to go over. And it's excellence in our servantship. I said this in advance a couple weeks back that there's there's one story about Jesus that's in all four gospels. And it's the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And the thing that sticks out to me the most of the feeding of the 5,000 is that they served 5,000 people. They had them sit down in groups and they went and served them. It would have been way easier for the disciples to sit back and say, make a buffet line. We're the ones that have to feed 5,000. You can come get your own food. But no, they served them because there's extra excellence in serving somebody versus convenience. We need to have excellent rest and we need to have excellent connection your relationship with God and with people. You should be reading his word. You should be praying. You should be worshiping to enhance your connection with God. And we are meant to be a community people. When Paul was writing to the, to the church of Corinth, he talks about how the church is supposed to be unified, that the sacrifice Jesus made is supposed to bring us all together. It unifies people together. The church is not supposed to be divided. You're not supposed to be separated. You're supposed to be connected with people. Purpose is important. To have purpose, you need meaning. And to have meaning, you need connection. So I encourage you guys this morning, write a personal vision. Write down your calling. Write down your desires. Write down your restraints. Get committed to that vision. Refer back to it often. And make excellence a habit in your life and in your vision.